on this computer. All right. It's an important step. It is. Yeah. Jay, we, we, we know about three hour conversations that don't get recorded, right? I've been in studio sessions too, where it's like, you know, oh, that sounded amazing. Um, yeah. Did you record that? No. <laughs> it was for our own ears. <laughs> Lost the right. greatest song ever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we're live i'm here with uh jay delay and sasha bailey and today we're going to talk about uh art curation on the blockchain um i think it'd be cool to kind of start off with a little bit of a background on who you are and and sort of maybe start with uh the perspective you're coming from in terms of uh art curation on the background uh whoever wants to go first go ahead Okay, if you, you want to go faster. Um, so for me, in terms of curation, like I've been on both sides. I've been really interested in, like for a while I was into street art and graffiti um, and trying to use kind of surfaces that are available to everybody to express themselves where there's nobody deciding what the public is presented with. But also I've, curated exhibitions and gallery shows and I've seen benefits of both and yeah there's definitely also um, drawbacks with both sides as well so I think it's an important consideration in terms of art history curation has not served the majority of people well and the majority of artists and up until recently this has been a huge problem with institution, it's a systematic, it's a systemic problem in terms of museums and galleries that's been going on for thousands of years in terms of who's been curating what is presented to the public. And um, it usually comes at the detriment of the majority and there's a few individuals that it usually benefits. So I think it's important conversation, especially as we move into a new medium, like a decentralized uh, system of artwork. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think, um, I think that's good because I think we're basically coming from the same perspective on what curation is, um, that it's not, uh, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, you, you agree with what I'm saying. That it's not so much about if you put it in the terms of a platform or like an internet, a website, it's not so much about deciding who gets in and who doesn't, it's deciding more about how you show it. So like if you had a, if you have a finite space, like a gallery, you would decide who would be in that gallery. But if you have infinite space, like a website, you may curate by doing collections or by moving people into a location where they get more visibility. Would that be would that be kind of we would agree on on that or would you say it's like would you would you say that the point of curation is at the kind of the gatekeeping part or after the gatekeeping part like has that kind of goalpost sort of moved due to the fact that now if you want to you can have every artist in the world on your platform but who gets visibility and who you put forward is a matter of i guess uh resources and time, but also deciding on whether you want your platform to be open or, because because I feel like the the word curation when it comes to platforms has been changed a little. And I think that the idea of deciding who gets in and who doesn't feels a little bit more like gatekeeping than curation. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you could say that that's a part of the curation for the site is, uh, who is allowed into the minting process. So that is a first step. And then once you get past that curated, you know, you're, you're curating your talent at that level. Um, yeah. You're deciding who has access to your gallery space or platform. And then after that, there's a second step of curation where um, in the crypto art space, it seems to be very push towards who's the top selling, you know, who has the most ETH sales at the moment. Yeah. And that's the way it's curated on a lot of platforms. Um, so there's many different ways. I, I would include the gate 
gatekeeping aspect as part of that curation in terms of curation of artistic aesthetic, whether it's an aesthetic choice, you know, like um, we want our platform to look like this um, and this is not allowed, this is not acceptable, or we're not gonna uh, permit this type of aesthetic. Um, so I, I think it's all in the scope of curation. Okay. So let's dive into some of these, but Sasha, give us a little bit of a background on sort of what you do. You're, uh, you're a fine art curator, correct? Yeah, I, I guess. I, um, uh, I mean, I, I would always have put myself more in the category of trying to find artists who are outsider artists or come from disenfranchised uh, backgrounds. And obviously I've, I've done shows of both kinds because to make a living you have to, but the general shows that I put the most time and money and kind of my, my own passion into have been the shows where I've shown off um, emerging artists and artists who I think are fantastic, who haven't been seen, but I always try to, and this is just, I guess, one of the, um, one of the facts of kind of marketing is I always tried to mix in a couple of really well-known artists so that there was a pool for the public to come and see these other um, smaller artists to make sure that they actually kind of, you know, got, got the exposure they deserved. Um, and the curation that I did then, it wasn't so much, you know, for instance, uh, I did a show with uh, on erotic photography. Obviously, I'm not going to put uh, a, a painting of daffodils in that, in that show. Um, but the, I guess the, the idea with what I, I used to do is I used to try and put as many artists as possible together within, and I always tried to kind of fit it around a theme, but so a lot of the time I would do the show, I would come up, I would get the artists together first, and then I would work out why they all fit together afterwards. So I'd be like, I want to show these 15 artists, I think they're great. And that wasn't like, uh, you know, me stopping people from getting ac access obviously some people don't but that because that's i think the key difference is um with a with a like i said with a with a website you have infinite space with a gallery you, you don't have infinite space someone's always going to move this out because you've got this you've got this issue of you know just just re wall real estate um so I think that was the that that was what I did for for ten years, and that's what I came into crypto art, and I kind of thought was this this was the best thing to do, because originally the BAE one point was 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 curated simply out of necessity, like I couldn't um, I couldn't have it as an open platform; it wasn't feasible uh, with the way that it worked. But now that we've got the tech, I, I strongly believe in the idea that it should be open to everyone, but unfortunately the drawbacks that I have as an individual is I am just one person. So I do end up having to curate in a sense, but I, I try and keep it, you know, I try and write artist profiles for pretty much every artist. I try and um, without thinking about anything to do with their sort of background or anything like that, just, just I'm interested in them and their art purely for that. But there is always the problem of manpower um, and being able to actually you know, it, it, it happens by accident, sometimes curation, it happens without you realizing that you're doing it because you just happen to focus on this side of things um, more than other side of things. If that makes sense. I use the word things a lot there. Um, That's all right. We, uh, so when we're talking about curation, we're talking about multiple uh, types of curation within this context. We're talking about talent curation. Um, we're talking about unbiased or uh, biased curation based on technology, not necessarily uh, what what you want to achieve, but what, what's possible to achieve with the technology that you're currently using. Uh, we're talking about technical bias in terms of, not technical, we're talking about um, uh, bias in, in terms of sales, right? Listing and curating people based on top 10 sales. So we've got a few different areas we can go. Uh, before we start diving in, I want to ask you both, what are some of the benefits of curation? Oh, Jay, I've been speaking forever. Um, I mean, there's several benefits in terms of, it's like making a mixtape. You know, you can create a mood, you can create a feeling, um, 
you can create an experience, okay? Um, so there's an aesthetic experience, there's visual and cultural experience that can be shaped in form. You can create a narrative. Um, you know, so there's lots of different things when you're talking about, you know, you'd have well-known artists and lesser known artists. Um, you know, you can do it in a way that is beneficial to as many different people as possible. I, I think there's, I started reading more on it. There's like curatorial activism, uh, which is popular now. Um, and it's kind of in response to the thousands and thousands of years of curation that have existed up to this point. Um, and it has mainly benefited the people at the top. It, yeah. Curation historically has benefited people that already had the wealth and the power. And it was a tool to have the artwork or culture reflect their values. Um, yeah, I, I would completely, I'd completely agree with that. And I am, um, I actually, the reason why crypto art attracted me so much is I spent most of my curation career trying to shift that away. And obviously you take some jobs that, you know, you've, you've got to make a living. So you, you have to play within the, um, the confines of the game sometimes. But I, um, within the crypto art space, I really wanted to create something different. And I guess the kind of create curation I tend to, to lean more towards, other than just writing artist profiles for people who I think they're interesting and I don't really generally do that on sales I just if I like the art visually I'll, I'll, I'll put the time in I'll, I'll write a profile um but like for example the way I've been doing it more is is collectors will come and say hey I want to get some artists that fit a b and c criteria and I'll write, okay well I've got some of those and I'll look through and find them obviously we have a, we kind of have a leaderboard out of a necessity because I, I feel like everyone's if if I didn't do that I would just be missing out on something but I tend to try and it, I, if I'm working with a collector I try and actually just ask them what they're looking for rather than go hey you should buy these because these artists are the top selling ones that are currently going um so like if a, if a collector came and wanted say only female artists for whatever reason I might go okay well, there's all of these artists that aren't on the leaderboard. There's these artists that are on the leaderboard. We, you should have a look at all of them and then put together a collection and then send them over a kind of PDF document, which is that collection of all those artists. And that's kind of the, the old school way of me, you know, going back to PDF documents and things like that. But of curating is to try and actually bring these collections out of the website and show them to people because I think I said um, in my last uh, interview my goal is to try and slow people down and make people think about what they're buying a little bit more and and why they're buying it rather than just going to the top artists because the 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 benefit like you were saying with curation benefiting um, the kind of you know the powerful already the leaderboard system that all of the platforms use and they, I mean, I, I know better, we use it too, but um, has the potential to create the exact same system where you're, when, when, when you're already on the top, you're going to keep being on the top because it becomes harder and harder and it, you, you snowball bigger and bigger until the point when no one can really knock you off. <laughs> Jay, I want to ask yes. you le leaderboards. Uh, sorry. I want to ask you, Jay leaderboards. Um, they provide a certain level of social proof, right? Uh, like this is working. Um, there are successful artists on this platform. So from like a UX perspective, I could see their value. Uh, but from a, from, if we were talking about changing the social construct of curation, um, what's, what would be like a benefit of not having, or maybe is there another solution to not having a leaderboard? I, I mean, definitely. Um, there are lots of different solutions. It's it's just become this go-to. I think partly because we're in a crypto space. I, I mean, probably next we'll have volume and then we'll see who's forming a bull flag on their sales. Um, and that's seen in OpenSea. You know, I can look at charts for art projects now. Um, but 
that doesn't necessarily have to be there. And getting back to the benefits of curation, it benefits select individuals that are already in power and that are already at the top. You know, most of these hierarchy um, systems of hierarchy and curation's been around for thousands of years. Um, you know, the Egyptians were great at curating a style where they forced artists to work within the confines of one style for thousands and thousands of years. And it benefited the few people at the top. Um, you know, the pyramid is supporting all those individuals at the peak, you know, but um, it's a broad base of people that are just like carrying all the weight that don't get any recognition. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. You could just take down the leaderboard. It, you could have um, it, images, it could be the latest thing, you know, it could be the likes just like on Reddit or Facebook. It could be whatever you want it to be. Um, I think like uh, Sasha said, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, just like people will FOMO into whatever crypto is like mooning at the time. You know, you look at what's got the top gains and you're like, oh, I want a piece of that action. So people like go ahead and get into whatever's at the top of the list and it can be profitable if you time it right. But you also miss out on a lot of talent or artwork that is nowhere near that top 10 level. Um, you know, I use it, uh, Van Gogh as an example all the time, you know, he sold one or two paintings in his lifetime, created thousands of works of art. So you have this abundance of artwork and we're talking, you know, scarcity and abundance is a great kind of theme that goes on in crypto art. Uh, so he had an abundance of artwork, but, um, no genius curators at the time stepped up and said, we need to put this in a gallery and make sure that this is sold. You know, he was out here making great artwork and um, it was neglected. And now it's some of the most valuable artwork, you know, it's just, you couldn't put a price on it. If it went to auction, it's, you know, nobody has an idea, especially in this current climate with people throwing money at everything, no telling what it'd go for. Um, so I, I think those opportunities are going to be missed if people are just constantly looking at who's at the leaderboard for the given moment or for the past year and the real, you know, gains are going to be made on the artists that are not maybe recognized for their potential or for their contributions to the space until years down the line. Sasha, you um, you seem to have a natural empathy for artists uh, that you want to bring put light on in your in your curation style by mixing it with already successful artists. Um, so when it comes to talent acquisition, how do you take that mindset and bring it into the crypto art space? So for the last year, I. And actually, I, blame, I completely blame Twitter from this, but obviously it's my fault, obviously. Um, but I wasn't on Twitter until like the end of 2019. And I really shouldn't have joined uh, because I like completely got sucked into it and, and it. and it corrupted the way that I think about art because previous to this, BAE was all um, artists that weren't necessarily crypto. And obviously I think there's, I want to have people who are, pushing the space forward and doing all of that. That's, that's super important. But I was mainly looking outside and I, I found, you know, some really interesting artists who haven't got the recognition they deserve. And I kind of, in the last few weeks, same as what Jay was saying, is I was looking more and more at the website and I was thinking, how, how am I going to do this? And I have been thinking about the digital curation and how we can approach that in a new way because I think the paradigm, I, I, I think there's some value to the leaderboard um, just as a, as a way of looking at it, but I don't think it should be the only way that you look at it. So I've, I, I, I look on Twitch, I look on um, Instagram, I look on Binance. I try and, I try and 
branch out and find as many artists as possible. Like uh, one of the artists who I think is hugely underappreciated, we've been working together for like two years now, um, and I, I've been trying to push her, uh, is, is Zalan. And um, we we literally, we speak almost every day. Um, and the same with Minju and a few other girls who I've been working with since the beginning of this, this whole space. And um, that I feel like maybe because they're not active as much in the Twitter community, um, crypto art community, they're kind of left out a little bit. And there's, I want to find a way to, like, I don't want this to come across wrong, because I think obviously it's really important to um, put the people who have pushed this community forward at the forefront. But I also think that it's becoming like a, there's there's a, there's a sense of it becoming quite closed and if you're not in the in group then you're not an artist that people are even going to consider if you're not you know you haven't been vocal about how much you're into crypto art since the beginning then you're not going to be an artist that's that's pushed um and I, i'm trying to find ways of bringing those artists from the outside before it becomes because because i the, the feedback i get from new artists is it's very confusing and I feel like I have a lot to catch up on. Like there's a lot of social dynamics and there's a lot of stuff going on that I feel like I missed and I'm kind of jumping halfway through a Spanish drama and I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many cerebral storylines that have happened that I'm not sure where, I, where I'm, where i you know, what I meant, to, who's, who's done what, who is what, what's, what's going on. Um, and, the community, and I wanna, the community yeah. does, uh, its own curation yeah. in a way through Twitter. Twitter is, I mean, I think we can all agree, Twitter is the town hall of crypto art right now. Yeah. That'll change, that'll change over time. There'll be, you know, as crypto art grows bigger and bigger. Uh, but certainly the technology and the conversations and the, the old guard, quote unquote, that are been in the space for four years or whatever, um, there, there is that, but I want to kind of focus on platform curation. Yeah, and... sorry, sorry. I... No, no, it's okay. Uh, I just, that's my job is to bring <laughs> us to, you know, focus. It. Uh, I think it's like my job to focus us in and, you know, we can we talk love you all for day. It. We appreciate it. Oh, well, you know, I, I try I, my best, I, Jay. I tend to go off in tangents. You have to, you have to yeah. just tell me to shut up when I um, when Me I go too. Off. You get your job <laughs> cut out for you here with both of us. That's so. okay. Yeah. I've had conversations with both of you before. I know how the work, how it works. But yeah, so I mean, I agree with you. Definitely, there's sort of like a level of um, what do you call it, like a layer for you to get through before you feel like you're 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 learned enough to be involved in the industry and get some awareness. Uh, but beyond that, art in general on the platforms, um, how how is that impacted? Um, so what, what, what I'm introducing, if I just, and I'll quickly try, I'll try and not go in on, off on a tangent. Um, what I'm introducing in the next phase of the BAE, which is before we do the redesign, before we do a bunch of stuff, is I keep calling it the achievement system publicly because I've noticed that a lot of the platforms like to just instantly kind of quickly copy off our platform's ideas and put them out before. So I'll, I'll talk about it because we're quite deep into the conversation. So I think the only people who are going to be listening are the artists. So I, um, I get, uh, I'll get, I'll, I'll get into it. But the, the idea is it's not an achievement system. It's a curation system. So you'll receive badges based on things that you've done. So this, this could be getting likes, sharing stuff on Twitter, uh, producing a certain type of art, any, as abstract as you could possibly make it. It's not going to be an automated system. It's going to be going to be manually done. Um, but so that means that then you can start filtering people by say Vaporwave. You can start filtering people by these genres that people, I think platforms have completely missed out, but then you can also go, Hey, I want to look at like, like you were saying, Jay, I want to look at an artist who's received a lot of likes or who's received a lot of following, but might not actually have a, a lot of sales. So there's other aspects of I guess it all falls down to some sort of ranking, but there's other aspects of that that you could go to. So, um, and, and really the idea of this is it could be as abstract as you could possibly think because I'm not, at some point in the future we'll automate it, but it's gonna be something that's just kind of 
done per request. Like an artist goes, hey, I produce 3D work. Can I have the 3D badge? And it's done that sort of way. But you can you can take that to any sort of extreme um, that you can imagine. So like you could say maybe this artist produces um, a huge quantity of work but hasn't sold a lot. So they'll get some sort of a badge just for being someone who perseveres. So that's that's kind of my 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 idea of how to, at least in some way, bring a sense of fair but new curation to the space. So it isn't just that leaderboard. Um, and 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 I I do keep calling it the achievement system, and I will keep calling it that. But it is really a curation system. Um, it sounds like a manually create like you're you're creating a manual uh, search system that is refined enough. So that it's not just AI that's deciding who you are, or ML. It's you know you're in collaboration with the artist. You're you're creating this manually searchable experience, so that collectors can then find what they're looking for, and maybe you know artists can also find similar people that they're looking for. Jay, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this uh, this sort of model. I think any model that's exploring different routes than what we're currently working with is beneficial um and being a new medium and i consider crypto art a new medium and we're developing new platforms to support these mediums uh I, we're kind of bringing the old models into this medium so um you know i'm a fan of McLuhan and his idea is that you bring um old technologies kind of styles and content and superimpose it on new technologies you know just like the theatrical performance became um a movie and we saw it move you know as the movie uh technology became uh, more developed it doesn't look like somebody's just got a video camera or a movie camera and, and shooting up theatrical performance um it becomes its own medium and its own content um, for, for like trying to figure out ways to get out of the leaderboard system, I think I would encourage every platform and I really appreciate what Sasha's done with, um, but, uh, with his gallery and I, I've talked to you before and I do think you have this really great way of creating relationships with artists and it's not, um, it's not the same system. So I, I applaud you for looking for other methods other than this leaderboard system, which is to me possibly detrimental um, to a large group of artists that you know you could have tons of small sales. So like you could you're you could have a very large impact on a lot of collectors, and that would not be reflected because it's not top ETH sales, you know? Um, so I, I think it's like looking at the top 40 list of whatever's the popular music. You're, you're gonna miss out on some of the most, um, you know, progressive or um, stuff that's really pushed in the envelope if you're just looking at the top 40. Yeah. Uh, you're just gonna miss the whole experience if you're looking at what's popular at the time. And um, I think platforms should encourage, should really try and figure out other ways to present it to the public. And the public should also be aware of it because when you go to any site, it, that top leaderboard is the first thing you see. You know, um, it, if not, it takes such a, such a huge portion that it becomes kind of this, you know, um, overwhelming lingering thing in the background you know it's there um it would imagine walking into like a museum or a gallery and they lined up all the artists be like yeah here's one artist here's you're gonna look at them first because they have the top sales now let's mm -hmm. walk mm -hmm. down here to the second artist um because they're second place in sales and let's present it in this context it's kind of absurd and um that's how crypto art is presented to the public. And a lot of people are coming into the space now with a crypto background. So they're looking to make 
profit off speculation. Like I'm gonna, yeah, I may have some personal attachment. I may like this artwork for whatever reason, but a lot of individuals are buying it because they want to flip it for profit. Yeah. You know, so there's multiple dynamics at play. Um, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong because, you know, being on the top of the leaderboard is cool. Yeah, like it's, it feels good to be an artist. Yeah, that, and that rewards behavior. But I, I think that shouldn't be the only system of presenting crypto art to the public. You know, I, I'm working um, with Steve Klebanoff and we've been working on a DAP and it's really, it's really an art exp experiment, but it's like decentralized curation where people decide what is going to be presented to the public by sending nfts to a artist collective vault vault you know um which will be constantly changing and um evolving like being swapped out so i think people should just experiment don't take one model because this is a new space we shouldn't just do things because we've done them in the past like we've curated galleries and let's kind of superimpose it into crypto art. Yeah, let, we are in a decentralized technology. Um, I think that we should explore ways to move beyond that system that has proven to be very detrimental to a majority of people yeah. and only best beneficial to a few. In, in McLuhan's um, sort of philosophy, that's what I think Nifty Gateway uh, is doing to the max, right? They're sort of bringing in established artists and uh, making huge sales and also getting uh, newsworthy information out there about our industry. So I see a benefit, see a benefit to this. Um, but I think right now, Everyone from a Beeple who's selling $3.5 million worth to me who's selling $150 of, of, a, uh, of an NFT are in the same ecosystem. It's not yet been sort of parceled out the way the traditional art world has parceled things out. And what I'm thinking about here, Jay, is we talked about folk art and there's value to folk art, but that in this space might not be recognized quite yet. Right. So how, how do how, how do we begin to parcel out these sort of like values, you know, craft art, folk art, these kinds of aspects to the industry um, in the space that we're currently living in? Well, if we don't figure out in a decentralized manner, a few people will figure it out for us. That's a good way of putting it. That's a, <laughs> thank you. That's, you know, very poignant and very accurate. And we will be living with that aesthetic for however long. Yeah, whatever they choose to present to us is going to become the dominant aesthetic. And it's going to make a few artists wealthy and a few individuals wealthy. Um, so I think we have this new decentralized technology. I think that artists, platforms, and curators, crypto artists should really try to take advantage of the decentralization and not fall into this trap of like, well, this has worked for us in the past. You know, it's worked well where, or worked well for a few individuals at least. You know, let's have some gatekeeping, gatekeeping to kind of let a few artists in to this platform and curate the space this way. Um, I, I think we need to explore new areas and new systems of curation. Hey, Sasha, how do you manage the gatekeeping aspect of uh, being a platform? Obviously you have some sort of like way to become an artist on BAE, but it seems to me like you're much different in the way you deliver, the way you talk about um, in inviting artists on than say a super rare or a nifty. Oh, so BAE is completely open. Anyone can join. Anyone can come and just upload. But what I've, uh, but what I've done is because I do think there is value in, and and I think there's value in verification. But I think there's value in verification in a different way than it's been approached um, by by say Rarible. Um, having golden tick on your on your uh, on your profile that means that you're on the leaderboard 
I don't really think helps anything. All you're doing is saying, hey, this person has emailed us and we have maybe possibly checked it at some point. So with the BAE, I thought the verification is necessary, but it doesn't stop you from appearing in any searches. It doesn't, it, there's no filter. Um, if you're on the artist page, you can filter by verification, but nowhere else. Um, and this is because the only thing that I think that verification should do is responsibility. And this is something that I, I think is a, I think all platforms should do this if they, if they truly are verifying artists. If the artist that they verify turns out to be fake and turns out to be selling um, literally, I mean, copied and pasted from, yeah. from Google, yeah, um, they should reimburse the buyers. And that's what the blue tick on BAE means, is it, I, I will reimburse you from my own pocket if this artist turns out to be fake. That's how confident I am that I'm checking these people properly. Um, and that's the only thing that ver that is the only criteria for verification on the BAE is that your art is original or highly transformative. I, I, and and that's more to give buyers peace of mind. And and I wish that we could just do it completely open and have everything just always, which it is you know anyone can upload, anyone can sell. Um, but I do think there is some value to giving buyers peace of mind. Um, in that they know that the, at least the platform is checked and then they can weigh up the risks and be like, hey, I really like this artist, but they haven't got the tick. I'm still going to buy it. Or I want the guarantee that the platform is going to promise me that this is real or not. And that's that's the only thing that verification really means on the BAE. I don't believe that it should stop people getting access to any sort of area of the website. I think that that's silly. Um, I think that it's... it. it it, it should just be a promise from you that you are selling a product that you believe is real. And other than that, the, other than that, people should be aware that there are tools like you can right click and do, uh, I would, I would suggest you do Google. I'm going off on a tangent. Sorry. Um, you do Google reverse image search and you use Google lens because they both find different things. Um, if you want to find whether an artist is real or not, because Google lens will generally pick up stuff that, it's more algorithmic. It will pick up stuff. It, it, it can find GIFs better. I've noticed it. That whereas Google um, reverse image search literally just finds the exact image, and it's really easy to trick it. Um, can you give me? So I, I, I'm interested, and I think some other artists would be interested as well. Maybe even collectors. What does the verification process look like? I'm sure it's different for different artists that you have uh, a relationship with. But give me like a hot, like a 5,000 foot view of what that looks like. Okay, so um, if you're new and I've never met you before and I haven't been speaking to you, obviously if I've seen you for, you for two years watching your Twitter and all that sort of stuff and you've been in a community, it's, it's going to be quite quick and that's just the nature of, of, of how it works. But if you're not, um, first you have to upload at least one artwork to the BAE because we charge a small tokenization fee, which is only $2. So in comparison to gas, that's nothing. Um, but it does put that financial incentive on people to be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to put it, it psychologically, it seems to have actually stopped quite a lot of people uploading fake artwork. Um, even though it's less than the gas, people almost see the gas as not spending money. Uh, some people, I think, especially scammers. Um, and then after that, you need to email us five artworks that you have created yourself. Uh, they don't have to be uploaded, but they just I need to see them so I can check every single one of them, a short bio about yourself and your social links. And if all of that checks out, and I think that that is, I, I don't, it's nothing to do with quality. It's nothing to do with anything like that. I don't, I don't look at that. It's just, if this, I truly believe that this is original, I will give you the verification tick. Obviously I'm one person, so it can take me a little bit of time to do that, but it's just about making sure that people are legitimately real. And I think that, I think because because my money is on the line, I have to be extra careful, and that's how I would generally do it. Because um, it's 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 the scammers are lazy, um, and they don't want to write a bio. They don't want to do that. And also, the bio helps me because then I can write you a artist profile further down the line. And I generally try and do that, like I said, for everyone. I don't really, in fact, I I, I generally speaking try and focus writing the artist profiles on artists that aren't selling yet rather than artists that are. Um, 
because what what I found is so I've worked um, I won't I won't mention who but I've worked for a uh, company in in buying up uh, crypto art for them and I've never bought anything for them that has been at the top of the leaderboard and I think we've we've purchased about 50 to 60 artworks now and every single artist that I've purchased for them has gone up by like a thousand percent over the last three months four months so what I would suggest to collectors is if you're buying from the leaderboard you're not buying from the right place you need you should go you should look through you should look for the quality you should look for something that really speaks to you and generally speaking the biggest gains you'll get are not from the artists who are already selling the big the, for the big amounts so if you are purely looking at this from a financial getting gains perspective buying artists that you love and that you think are good are mu you're much more likely to get gains from and also um it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if you buy an artist who's low priced it will increase the value of that artist and another collector will buy it. Like, I, I, I think both artists and collectors miss that they are actually the market makers. Um, they, they don't realize that by buying an artist, they're increasing their value. And this is the same for artists. Artists don't realize by what platform they choose to list on, they're increasing that, that platform's value. It's not the platforms, and I'll say this is the BAE as well, the platforms don't do anything. The people who do stuff are the artists, and the artists make every single one of the platforms big. Um, I do think there is something to the way Nifty Gateway presents everything, because they're ultra curated, ultra ridiculously over the top, all of this, you know, and obviously they put a lot of money into stuff. But um, yeah, I think I think collectors, collectors and artists both need to realize that they are the market makers, not the platforms. I can I piggyback on that. Yeah. Um, since we are in, you know, like crypto art, I think that crypto artists who are interested in decentralization and who are interested in doing away with former systems of gatekeep, gatekeeping, which is part of the curation. Okay, so I appreciate what you've done with BAE to take the curation as the part of the process where you're highlighting people that come into the space, but not, you know, setting up a barrier and curating the talent by like having the application process, because if I remember correctly, you are open, completely open yeah. to people to mint. So I would encourage crypto artists to move away from what I consider to be an outdated model of curation um, and move towards more open platforms like BAE, Rarible, OpenSea. And when I got started in this space, I was minting on the artist liberation front contract. Um, Oh, I haven't heard of that one. What is that? What is that? Johnny Dollar um, set it up and it was just like an open contract where anybody could mint anything and it would, you know, you could mint it. And it was a little tedious for me anyway, in terms of like getting the image and the data. It was a little more technical than most platforms. It wasn't as user friendly, but I think now they've got it where it's a minting a contract that's available to freely use. He's burned the the keys so he no longer has control over it so it's just kind of free to anyone that wants to use it um so i think you're um you're doing it the right way in terms of curating your space and the reason i was really interested in being part of this conversation is because curation is not I, i've used it a lot in my artwork it's not necessarily an evil thing because we all curate like i've curated the stuff in my house you know like i curate the stuff that i listen to and i cur curate you know what um i see in terms of visual arts and labels do it with bands but um open systems of curation are much more beneficial if we have decentralization 
instead of closed systems where you're only allowing a few people to come in and then you're curating from those few individuals. So it's like steps and tiers of curation that I think are detrimental. Um, and, and it gets progressively so. So it like it, it does kind of sorry. So like you kind of mean I guess I kind of see I see I get what you mean now is like so if you have like a filter on the way in and then another filter and then another filter by the time someone gets to the end you've got like two or three people whereas if you have the less filters you have to go, for people to go through the wider range of people you're going to end up with is that kind of what you mean by the yes exactly um, you know if you have a handful of platforms that are doing really well financially within any marketplace. Let's say you got five to 10 platforms that are the big draws for people's money, attention and culture. Okay, so we're not just dealing with money, we're dealing with culture here, okay? And culture encompasses uh, a lot of different things in terms of what people uh, think. You know, so it, it, it affects people's uh, emotions, their thoughts, and you're also dealing with, in, in, t in terms of curation, it, you could look at the history of cur curation up until last year, and most people's voices have not been included. And I'm not talking like this, some outdated, archaic system of curation, like a majority of individuals have been left out of large systems and institutions. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Gorilla Girls. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware of their work. Um, you know, they've done a great uh, service to highlighting the inequalities in museums and in galleries and how wealth and power has been used to kind of push people to the side. And if we have a few platforms, five to 10 platforms that are making big moves in the space, what you're gonna have is a few people making decisions at those five to 10 platforms that control what we see. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna dive into this, but I wanna dive into it with a specific question. Um, <laughs> Sasha, you pointed out that artists and collectors are the market maker. Um, and Jay, what you're pointing out is uh, that if we have a broader uh, curation capabilities, more people will get seen. Uh, right now, while artists and collectors are the market makers, where you mint matters oh, yeah. to collectors. Uh, it's the old paradigm, super rare, maker's place, known origin, nifty, you know, the top five. Yeah. Um, if you mint there and, and you're in the top leaderboard, you're going to continue to make money. So we're, we're not, we're not, we're right now, we are in the old way of doing things. Um, it's yeah. very centralized. It's yeah. very centralized it's not a level into the centralized field. technology. I yeah. do think though, um, the, idea of people paying more because an artist is on super rare or an artist is on uh, any one of it specifically it happens a lot with super rare and nifty um, mm -hmm. more than most i think that's actually a new thing and that's a sign of market immaturity because i think that if for instance if you took that to the real world and i was selling and there were two galleries next door to each other one of them was selling a let's just say a banksy for two grand and next door, the other one was selling it for 20 grand. You're not gonna go to the shop that sells it for 20 grand. You're gonna go to the shop that sells the exact same thing for two grand. Like you would, no one would go to the shop selling it for 10 times the price. So I actually think that that whole thing of buying it from Super Rare because, or, or, or Nifty, because it's on that platform is something that will disappear naturally because essentially the artist is where the value is not the contract I, I i think that i think that that's that that really is just just people i mean really if you were doing that in real life you would just people would just be like well that gallery is a ripoff i'm not gonna go shop there 
like <laughs> it, it, it's not you know it's it's not to, not to be too discouraging on it but i do think that that will eventually equalize as artists to centralize out more um and collectors realize that why am i paying more just because this is a label essentially a label attached to it yeah yeah one of the things uh i'm wondering if a recommendation here for collectors if we're looking 20 years down the road and we see gary cartilages on uh, super rare going for 5,000 and he could barely get, you know, three ETH and he could barely get an ETH on rareable is the rareable purchase yeah. uh, a better, a better investment looking 20 years well, down the road. I mean, he I can, on... I, I, oh, sorry, sorry, I can no. answer that. I'm sorry. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> and then you can thank all of the trash artists for bringing the property value down. <laughs> And giving those collectors that better deal. Yeah. And I, I mean, and it's the same for Gary on, uh, using Gary as an example, Gary on BAE 1.0, you could pick up, actually, there is still a Gary on BAE 1.0 that's probably one of his best works that's $350. But um, you could pick up his stuff for $50 to $100. And then on 2.0, he sold for around one ETH. Um, but it, it's crazy that those people who bought his stuff at $50 are going to make so much are going to have so much more of a profit and so much more uh, from their art um, than anyone who bought it from Super Rare for 3000 now. Although, speaking of Gary, I think that he's probably not hit his ceiling yet. Um, yeah, he he warrants those. His work warrants those prices. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, like... I only use him as an example of the disparity between buying it on Super Rare versus yeah. buying it on... I think I, Gary's amazing. Although yeah. I don't know if that's a a kind of myth because Gary moved straight to, like so just before Gary moved to Super Rare he was selling on BA between one and two ETH and he then moved to Super Rare the prices of ETH skyrocketed and he started selling for two to three ETH so I don't know if that's necessarily a, a factor of just timing um, or whether it's actually what it, it actually happened because a lot of artists that we've had and this happens the uh, super a used to do this a lot more and they don't really have to do it anymore but um because now they've got their own kind of brand but they used to uh basically watch bae and then just kind of try and take the artists that were selling the best and move them over to super rare and it's like well if these artists one one perfect example was twist vacancy he came through bae and as soon love as his work. His work I, love, I, I think he's fantastic. But his work was selling for a decent price. We had a plan. We were moving forward. And then he moved to Super Rare. And this is this is way back when um, when actually BA was outselling Super Rare, believe it or not, that there was a point in history when that was happening. Um, and they switched that around and they took they took those artists, they kept, it kind of got, got, got on my nerves a little bit because they kept DMing artists who were selling well and being like, hey, why don't you come over to our platform? And it was at a point where there was literally no difference in sales. Um, and I, I only know this because a lot of the artists I work with, I've worked with for a lot longer than crypto art. So they kind of messaged me and they were like, hey, this platform's asking me to just move over. Um, and it, I feel like they built them. So I feel like they did this to own origin and they do it this to make his place. And I'm kind of uh, going off on a huge tangent here, but I, I do think that Super Air as a platform has taken more from other platforms than they have actually added to the whole industry. And I wish that Super Air John was here so I could confront him about this. Um, but, uh, they I, they were invited, uh, yeah. and many of the other platforms were asked and invited. Some didn't get back to me. I don't need to name names. Others did, and they had plans. But there, the intention was uh, certainly to include um, all levels of 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 people who are curating on ETH specifically, because I think that's where the majority of the collectors are. Yeah. Um, I have a separate panel coming tomorrow sometime that's going to be focused on sort of alternate, you know, chain, alt chain NFT platforms, which I think is going to be a really interesting conversation. What happened to Jay? He's, he's uh, I don't know. He's oh. on, he, maybe he just had to take a break or something. All right. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. oh. I, I just Your had video's to go mobile. Up. I had to go mobile for a minute. Got so it. I didn't want I like it. distracting backgrounds and stuff. I, I'm here and, and 
join the conversation. All right. Um, yeah. So, so I, I think that, okay, if, if we're going to talk about curation, I think that Super Ed's form of curation was to just go, hey, we're crypto people who don't know a lot about art and um, I'm going to be quite harsh, don't have a very good eye for artists. Mm. We're just going to look at known origin and we're going to look at um, BAE and we're just going to take the artists so that they think are good and then put them on our platform. But they specifically do it by sales. And it's, it's, it, 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 I, I really don't like Super Rare. I'm just going to come out and say that. Like, I'm really not a fan. Of, I'm not, it's not even, it's not the platform. It's not that they sell. I love that. They, I actually really like Maker's Place because I think that they bring, a lot of people don't, but I, I, I think they bring a lot to the industry. I think they, they have a model and they bring a lot of cool artists in. And they are actually making an effort to expand it. I, I, I think that the way that Super Air does business gets under my skin um, because it isn't trying, they, they don't feel like they're trying to push boundaries. They just feel like they're trying to take whatever's successful and sell it for more than anyone else sells it for. And that, 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 generally irritates me because it's 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 like an a, in england we call them essex galleries and um they kind of they're they, they're just selling shiny marilyn monroe's and diamond dusted and uh things for as expensive as they possibly can and it's all a bit vacuous and it's it it, it sorry i've gone off on a tangent it, it really gets under my skin uh, it's, it's all right <laughs> oh, it's yeah. all good yeah, yeah. Can can we? So we've talked a little bit about the benefits of curation. Yeah. Jumping off of that um, tangent, which I appreciated hearing. Um, what about the problems of curation? What do you think are some of the drawbacks? Since that's your that's your role. The limitations of being one person. So I mean. If I could get investment for the BAE and it wasn't like it's completely self-funded and it's it's just pretty much me working here. So um, I wouldn't invest in, I obviously I'd invest a bit in marketing, but I would invest mostly in hiring people who are from, who, who have, who I know have an eye for artists and aren't going to just pick based on sales. They're going to pick based on, you know, this person's interesting. And I would hire a team of people to bring in artists into the space who otherwise wouldn't be interested in the space, help onboard them to the technology and help bring them in. Um, my main focus would be on, on getting the arts people in. So I think the main drawback of curation is that we're in a decentralized space, but I'm not a decentralized person. So I can't be everywhere at once. I can do my best, but I will always have, unfortunately, I will always have some biases. I will always have some things that I can't control that I will just end up moving towards naturally because I like this type of art or I like that type of art. Um, and that's why I try and focus on new new people writing bios and, and people who I haven't written bios before and not just go by the leaderboard. But yeah, I think I think the the real major drawback of curation is um, it can make you lazy because you can you you find something that works and you keep repeating the same thing, um, and also the the fact that you know limitations of just being one individual. Um, and, and I think that's the same of pretty much all the platforms, even the ones that have a lot of funding. Uh, they don't actually put much, of, they don't seem to put as much time and attention into curation, except for maybe Async does. Um, but obviously that's a very curated platform, but they put quite a lot of time, I think, into their, their curation process. But I, yeah, I, I think that we need to expand it out and look for more people. Um, and, and I do think that I do think you need to be proactive. So I think there's a different a, a, a difference between the say the way that I do it and the way that Rarible does it. Where Rarible will just kind of I, I, you see them on Instagram, they'll just kind of like a bunch of people's posts and be like, hey, we exist. Um, but I think that there is a benefit to going and actually being like, hey, I, we've got this platform. You should come join, and then walking you through the process of actually joining. Part of the curation process for both artists, platforms, and uh, I would dare even say collectors, uh, is marketing. 
and marketing, uh, spending the amount of time to market the artists that are on the platform, maybe even though maybe even those that don't have high sales, right? So if we're talking about manpower bias, of course they're going to focus on uh, platforms that that are centralized are going to focus on where they can get the highest return on investment. Uh, and marketing artists that are up and coming is not one of those areas, but it seems like you are spending some of your time do, doing that. Jay, I'm wondering uh, what the responsibility of uh, artists in the marketing aspect of themselves is in the curation process. And how does that, how does curation impact them from a detrimental perspective? So in my eyes, as a crypto artist working with decent, decentralized technology, uh, and part of the reason I think most of us got into cryptocurrency is that we realized there was a problem with centralized finance and the central banking system, okay? So if you are into crypto art, you need to take that same mindset and apply it to art. There is a huge problem with centralized curation. And it's not something that's in the past with, um, you know, the pharaohs in Egypt or, you know, artists producing artwork that only the wealthy get to enjoy, or maybe every now and then you can come look at what we think is important for you to look at. And this is something that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And artists have only started rebelling against it pretty recently in the terms of history of art. Um, you know, you go back a few hundred years you know, and you have impressionism rebelling against the Royal Academy. That's fairly new in terms of the history of humanity. So I think in terms of crypto art, we have this great chance to just reject this method and stop using centralized closed systems and move to open decentralized platforms. Um, and I think there's tons of reasons to do it. I'm not saying it's gonna be a perfect solution. I think there's gonna be problems and there's gonna be things that will have to be worked out. Um, but I wanna read something to you because this is, this is important to me. Um, so in a recent study of museums, and we've been talking about thousands of years, okay, in terms of art history, they found that at museums, 85% of the works by white, were white artists. 87% of the works were white male. This is last year. Yeah. And I don't think taking centralized curation to a new technology is gonna solve the problems that we have within our society. No, I, 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 I actually completely agree um, with, with, on that front. I, uh, what, 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 I, what I would like to actually ask though is, is, is a other question is, is so in, in like the 70s, 80s, 90s, you've got like Larry Gagosian coming up, you've got Basquiat, Warhol, Keith Haring, or this relatively diverse group of artists. There were a lot of female artists around as well. They probably didn't get as much recognition as they should have. Um, but those, that area, you could call that kind of period in time relatively decentralized with, with Gagosian before it became big. He was kind of selling it wheeler dealer. It wasn't, you know, doing these pop-ups with as many different galleries as possible and kind of, you know, as many different kind of areas, keeping it relatively for the time with, you know, centralized people, fairly decentralized. But over time, obviously Gagosian became this big monster that is a hugely centralized uh, system of art. Do you think that all systems eventually move towards centralization and that's an inevitability until they kind of reach a point that they implode, break apart, and then decentralization happens again? It's, do you think it's like a cycle or do you think um, that it's more of a or do you think it can be maintained or do you think that there's an inevitability of kind of increasing and decreasing centralization? Um, 
I think it's human nature to move in cycles, you know, so I think that's what every art movement has been based on. And one generation does one thing and then the next generation either runs with it or reacts against it and rebels against it. And I think that's what we do. We, we go from one extreme to another and we're like, oh, that doesn't work. Let me, let me go over here. So that's why I don't think total decentralization is gonna be an answer. Because what I would think would happen is that if you move to decentralized curation, art would become a reflection of the society. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's still gonna be problems. <laughs> Yeah. So it's not like decentralization is going to solve all the problems. However, it's still people, I, right? Yeah. However, I think this is an important move because what it does is it puts the responsibility on all of us. Instead of saying, hey, there's a few people at the top that are not doing such a great job. Um, we can be like, hey, this is not just a few wealthy gallery owners or a few wealth um, wealthy like donors to museums like this is what we are yeah. and we have chosen this. Um, so what are some things, Jay, that, that you would like to see artists do with other artists uh, to help move this decentralized curation model forward? Oh, uh, minting on open platforms trying to figure out ways to curate within open systems. Um, so I think curation is not necessarily, like you can't put it, I, I don't wanna make it seem like curation is something that I'm against because it's not, but I, I, I'm i against closed curation where you're only allowing a few individuals to curate a space. Um, so I think if it's a level playing field where we have open systems and people can curate within those open systems, um, and yeah, there will kind of be hierarchies within that, but at least it's, you know, on the same grass, you know? <laughs> you know what well, I'm saying? But an equal playing field kind of thing. What, what, what's yeah. Like, I'm a, a, yeah. A, a, kind of an example. I, I, I don't know if this, this, this works, but if we look at, like YouTube, for instance. Uh, YouTube started out as a um, completely open platform. Anyone could upload. The algorithm that they used was relatively fair. I mean, it could obviously be tricked, um, but it was it would promote more of whatever someone wanted to see, and it would it would it would obviously it had its drawbacks. It had its problems, but as it got bigger and bigger. YouTube has now decided to mess with its algorithm and it doesn't point you to what you used to like something I used to really enjoy just for the fun of it was watching conspiracy theories on YouTube and completely non seriously just just enjoying them. Um, good for the pure entertainment value and they disappeared like completely like they made it the, the, the platform generally used to push they curated that. it. Yeah, they, that's what I mean the, the platform used to push you towards that content. The algorithm naturally so do you think that i guess what i'm trying to ask is do you think that the system because I, I think i think youtube originally the way that it was at the start is an example of something that was completely decentralized um uh, in, a, in a in a sense i mean the algorithm had problems but it was just, you know anyone could upload anyone could rise to the top you know, you'd have one random blog, a beauty blog would suddenly rise to the top. And then on the other side, you would have someone talking about how there's a million faces on Mars rising to the top as well. It was like this completely hodgepodge madness of um, everything. Which I don't know. Was, yeah, sorry, sorry, go on. No, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily decentralization either because it's, you're the central role in that. So that's just like an algorithm pushing random videos to your interest. Um, so it's like cura it's curating based on your taste. They moved from curating based on like putting your interest at a higher value uh, to putting um, what they can monetize at a higher value. That's why a lot of your 
a lot of the things you might be interested in, but you know, for entertainment value don't come up anymore. It's because they're pushing you towards content that they can monetize. Yeah. And so it's like either an echo chamber or moneymaker. Yeah. So that's yeah, what I, I think we're seeing that. I mean, we're seeing that in crypto art now we have, you know, echo chambers, we have uh, money makers. Um, I think in 20 years, we're not going to recognize any of this. And some of what we're, we're hoping can happen with decentralization will happen. And then some of it will just be completely uh, unpredictable. Um, what are you looking forward to in terms of curation in the future? For me, I, I'm looking, well, the near, very near future, I'm looking forward to crypto artists and platforms, open platforms anyway. Not, I, I'm not looking forward to anything in closed systems. Uh, I have no faith in that. It, history, thousands of years has proven that that's not beneficial to the majority of people. We don't need to repeat that in crypto art. Uh, I'm looking forward to crypto artists forming collectives open platforms, seeing how they can curate their space. And like you said, Sasha, yeah, it's like you have an infinite, an infinite amount of like curatorial space yeah. where before you had this physical gallery that you had to curate. So there are challenges to this. Like, how are you going to present that? Um, but also I really, I'm looking forward to, and I, you know, I've been working with Steve on this DAP and it's just kind of an experiment and seeing where it goes, where you have groups of people curating like a, almost like a swap, like a unit swap for crypto art, but using that as like a context for an exhibition, just like experiment, see what we can do with decentralization. And this is a new medium. We don't have to come at it with, the mindset that we have used in previa, previous media. You know, like we've, we're, we've, we've, we know what a gallery system looks like. We know what museums have done. Like we don't need to repeat that. We need to look at this in a new light other than looking in the review mirror and then driving forward, you know. Sasha, we, uh, we don't, we do have unlimited space to curate, uh, but the difference between curation in the physical world and curation online is attention. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, cura you're, you're vying for eyes to see your content. And um, what, what do you think, how do you think you are addressing that at BAE? So at the moment, BAE, what you see on BAE is, is me over the last years, getting together as much budget as I could and building it. So, so what you're generally looking at is a function template. It's not what the final site's meant to look like. It was built by one dev who's fantastic. Like, uh, but you can tell it's a backend dev. It, it's not. It's it's very functional. What what I want to do is, and and this is why I've kind of taken a step back from from the whole space for a little bit. Is a uh, I want to find a new, like you're talking about, a, a new way of um, curating. And I've been thinking about, I keep calling it the achievement system. It's, it's, it's not an achievement system that's, that cheapens it. But it, it, I'm, I think that maybe, and this conversation has actually really helped uh, me, me kind of think about it, is maybe the way of doing it, and it might be a little bit chaotic, is to actually have people earn this, these badges but they essentially earn uh our currency bae pay on the site for doing certain things not for buying and selling because I, I don't think that's necessarily uh creates a good system but for certain activities like getting a certain amount of likes and then with that bae pay they can then choose to buy curation badges i say buy they would have earned it for for just using the site and then they choose their own curation. And then that may result in some people labeling themselves as 3D when they're not. But maybe a little bit of chaos is worth the benefit of people being able to choose their own kind of algorithmic path. I don't know. I, um, 
Honestly, I've forgotten what the question was. I don't know if I completely went off in a tangent. Then. What I was <laughs> asking was, yeah. uh, you know, when we're talking about curating in a physical world, uh, yeah. space is limited, but you have lots of eyeball attention that come into this gallery. On the internet, you know, online space is infinite, but you're still, you're you, now you're vying for eyeballs. Eyeballs are the uh, commodity. Wait. Right. So let me ask you both this. You could both answer this. What what can an artist do in this environment where we see traditional curation uh, models? Uh, what can they do to get the get the eyeballs of the of the galleries uh, of the fucking curators, not curators, collectors? Fuck, couldn't get that question out. Question was. How can artists get within the eyeballs of collectors who are currently on platforms they don't have access to? Go. I, I upload to BAE. That's going to be my answer to that. I can't, sorry, I, I, I genuinely can't think because some, some collectors are so stuck. Like you see them on Twitter say things like, oh, well, if you're on Super Rare, I buy this. And it's like, oh. Just, just buy it anyway. I don't like. I, I don't understand that mindset at all, and, and I don't know if that's those collectors are ever going to change that mindset. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like, there's there's going to be some collectors that are just like, I want a super rare piece. I want a nifty piece. That they're going to just totally buy into that brand, and it and it probably doesn't even matter really who is minting. Yeah, like they're just going to be like, oh, this is on nifty. Yeah, this is on Super Air, and I'm going to go for it. Um, I think one way is to just be authentic, because if if an artist is authentic, it shows through. You, like, you just, it's hard to deny when somebody's 100% who they are. Um, and I don't know that that's something that... Um, you, you just can't force anything, you know, like it just has to, you can put hard work into it, but you have to be a hundred percent of what you are. Even if it's ripping somebody off, you gotta be a hundred percent when you're doing it. <laughs> Cause I, I've, I've seen some, some artists and listened to some bands where it's like, yeah, like that's the best Rolling Stones rip off cover band I've ever heard, you know, and there's no shame in it yeah. because they're, they own, the fact that they're ripping somebody else off and you can totally just steal somebody else's style and do it just as good no, um, I think as long as you're doing something original there is absolutely like if you're doing it in their style but it's almost it's but it's not you've not just copied and pasted it i think that's perfectly acceptable yeah yeah I think people, you're using you're yeah. using it as inspiration yeah, I, I think people should really get off artists' backs about people who do that because I, as long as it's not, you know, copy paste from Google, it, it you still put the work in to create it. Just because it looks like a Basquiat or it looks like a Warhol doesn't mean that it is. Thank you. It's yeah. been my experience that those who typically jump on the backs <laughs> of artists in this space um, have limited understanding one of what the process of creating art is about. Yeah, and ha and even have like this just a broad uh, perspective of what art history is. So they know the Basquiat's, they know the Warhols, and you know if you look like that, well, you're trying to be that. And unfortunately, it comes from I think a lack of understanding of of you know how we as artists learn. We copy from each other, we steal from each other, we borrow, we collaborate, we collect. I think and you're not is, looking far enough back either. I mean, you've totally. got to look so to really understand that whole period of art. You've got to go all the way back to the point where Picasso changed from painting realistic scenes to painting unrealistic scenes, and probably take some mescaline to understand maybe why that happened and a few other things. But generally speaking, I mean, you have to look at that whole period. People seem to have this window where they only see back to the Warhol, they only see back to Basquiat. They, 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 there's a lot of art history that's missed um, between them and Picasso. I think pre-Picasso, it's all great, but you, you're generally looking at photography, like in the sense that it is just meant to look 
the best possible version of a person. A lot of the artwork's beautiful and a lot of it's fantastic, but it takes almost going all the way back to Michelangelo and Da Vinci before you start to actually see something that isn't just essentially an old style version of a photo. Well, there, there's a lot of art before Picasso that isn't trying to be realistic or photographic. Um, it's not in terms of like the Renaissance to, uh, I guess, you know, Impressionism. That's what's happening in the Western world, but the rest of the world's not trying to do oh, that at all okay. sorry 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 I, I i'm i'm pretty much exclusively talking about european european art I'm yeah the, re the rest of the world cares yeah. very little about yeah. that yeah but that also <laughs> speaks to curation in a way when we think about art history 101 and art history 102 it covers all of what we're talking about western world art maybe yeah. briefly covers you know asian art and african art and but you really focus in on your Picassos, you focus in on your Michelangelo's, your Leonardo's, the classics, the turtles, right? Well, there's, the, the there's 15 turtles. chapters of that, and there's like a few chapters of everything else. That's exactly right. And so that's another form of curation that, that we're not only uh, battling in this space now, because this is the education that collectors have come up with. Uh, yeah. Their understanding of, you know, what art history is, is 15 chapters of, of Western art history. Of mostly white people. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, African art gets a chapter. Asian art gets a chapter. Uh, yeah. South American art gets a chapter. And then Western, nah, it's like European art gets 15. Well, that's actually, I mean, that's, I guess that's kind of speaks to what I just, uh, what I, what I said. And, and in a way speaks to my, my own biases in a, in a funny sort of ways is I, I did just give the example of, um, what they give in the art history books, which is down to Picasso and then the Renaissance and then everything else didn't really happen. Um, and yep. since being in Japan, I've, I've, there's a lot of, there's a huge amount of art over here that, that, that's been missed out from the history books. There's, there's, there's more influences that people should get. And actually uh, Van Gogh, the Van Gogh is, is a good example because he has a whole period where he has Japanese inspired art. And um, a lot of the impressions were inspired, art. yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's a very good point. I uh, I mean that 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 speaks to my own personal thing as well. Uh, is I is that is that is if you look at just the Western side of things, that is how it's viewed. There's like um, there's Picasso. There was Renaissance, then a bunch of photography kind of stuff, then Picasso, and mm -hmm. then art kind of and then art kind of happened. But that's not really the truth. That's not really what actually went on. And what's uh, what's interesting to me is like. Um... So you have in Western art anyway, you have artists trying to depict things naturalistically or realistically. And then photography comes along and that's when you see this movement away from like trying to paint realistically. So like with the advent and invention of photography, you have the birth of impressionism happening around the same time. Um, it's, it's such a cool kind of thing going on the way the technology influenced the painting. Uh, not just from snapshots, like the composition of impressionist, impressionistic painting, but um, the cap, trying to capture the effects of light in paint, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, it's, it, you're right. Photography kind of did change art in a huge way because it was like, oh, God, we've got to do something different. Otherwise yeah, we're we going to buy what we're doing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a, it's such a cool, cool kind of period of, of art history. Um, but in terms of like impressionism being influenced by Japanese art and post impressionism, um, from what what I know, it's like there a lot of them were seeing Japanese prints like balled up in shipping cartons. So like they would use it kind of like packaging material, where you'd have like a messed up print that would be used to protect like china or porcelain. And that's how a lot of these artists were exposed to a lot of the Asian art. And then that became an influence on their style. Well, there was also this show, and I only know about this weirdly because my mother-in-law is in a, was in an all female acting troupe and they did a show on it and I watched it over Christmas. I, I, I didn't understand any of it because it's all in Japanese, but the, the basic story was there was in, in around Van Gogh's 
time, there was a Japanese businessman who wanted to bring Asian uh, and Japanese um, theater to the West. And he tried to do it in New York and no one cared. Um, they didn't, he, he didn't do it. So he took it to France and it became this really big thing. And apparently that's where it is well, a lot of the um, influence from Japanese culture came into the kind of the, uh, the French art scene is um, yeah. he, he became super popular. And I, I should know the names of all of this sort of stuff, but I don't. Um, but that is, a, that, is, that is a thing that, that happened. He was the first person to bring um, with the government, the Japanese government's kind of sponsorship to, to bring it outside of the um, of Japan. Yeah, that's that's so cool, and you know, that's the one reason I feel so fortunate to kind of be in the crypto art scene because we're, I mean, I I interact and communicate with people from all over the world. Like I just feel so privileged, and um, it's so so cool to be able, to, you know, like you're in Japan right now, and you know, second realm Eric's up there um, in New the Jersey. Northeast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dirty jurors yeah, I, as some people like to call it yeah and you know just meeting people from all over the world in this crypto art space and i i think that we're in a unique position um in terms of crypto art to move away from from what has happened in the past mm -hmm. um in terms of art history and art curation and people all over the world from all, um, you know, different, different perspectives, people's, you know, races, gender, orientation, socioeconomic status, whatever could benefit from this decentralization. And if we approach it from a few platforms and I imagine if you go look at the platforms, most of them are in westernized nations. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. So even even ours is is we, I think it's it's England and uh, I guess rare, I get rareables Russian, right, or Ukrainian yeah. or something. But it's um, a U.S. based business, I believe. Oh, oh, right. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. So they're all they're all from L.A except for known origin of the AE is, is basically the entirety of the, and I think that will change. I, I think that it will branch out. I mean, I'm trying to bring as many Japanese artists just being here um, as I can into the space. Um, but I, I, yeah, it is, it is very, I think, you know, I, I, and I'm sorry, wait, wait, I, I remembered something I was going to say about, because last time I got a lot of flack I was on with, with um, Eric over saying that artists, I, people thought that I said artists shouldn't speak out, but what I was saying was, I just want to clear this up, I was saying that you can do it in one of two ways. If you want to go difficult and you, want, and you stick to your guns, but you might not pay off right away, you can be as outspoken as possible. But if you want an easy ride and you don't want to be, um, and you just want to sell, just kind of let your art speak for itself. And then what I was going to say about that and being true to oneself is um, an example of, of Vesa, uh, the artist, because him through all of this has stuck to his guns and he's never changed his opinions. He's never changed what he believes. And some people may hate him. Some people may like what he set, has to say, but he's never changed his convictions. And it's taken him maybe two years but it has really paid off for him he's got his own studio he's got his own it's gone really well so i think if anyone was going to look at an example he may not be the biggest seller in crypto art um but it has worked him being dedicated to what he believes in and not changing that and i think that's uh I just wanted to because we were bringing that about, up about earlier about sticking to your convictions and I just I, I actually think that that's turned out as an incredibly inspiring story and the same for um uh Tom Badley um he may not sell as much in crypto anymore but he sells an unbelievable amount of physical notes um people really interested in what he wants to do so I think in this space sometimes people will not necessarily they'll come through crypto and they'll build a name for themselves and by sticking to their guns and being outspoken and whatever they believe in their audience will find them 
But that being said, I do still believe that if you want an easy ride as an artist, it's best to be apolitical. That's just my, but only if you want an easy ride. That's, that's, sorry. So, I just wanted to clear that up because I got so much flack on social media last time. Yeah, so, and that was, that was my fault. <laughs> that, part of that is my fault because I specifically clipped like a very small piece of our conversation out of context. And then people reacted to it. But I will say this. Um, I experiment. I was, I'm doing a 90 day experiment where I don't talk politics at all. Uh, my interactions have gone up 50 fold. Okay. Uh, it's been, it's been a really positive experience. My growth has been like, when I talk about growth, I talk about like, uh, you know, my sales, uh, not, not sales. <laughs> They're not there yet, but, um, but, but the like, reach, right? my reach is, is gone yeah. a lot further. Yeah. And I find that really interesting because I could be really divisive when it comes to politics and was really divisive, uh, especially for my political art, which was, you know, highly charged with uh, some Nazi imagery and Trump. So of course, very, lo very loaded, very loaded. Yeah. Yeah. But what? I'm, you know, making this effort, I'm, curating quote unquote curating my own uh you know my own communications now and what i find is it's it's a lot easier to make inroads yeah just by I, not being political i think uh matthew mcconaughey did a did an interview i can't, I can't remember with who but it was, was someone on youtube he got a lot of flack for it but he did say something in it which i think was really really right where he was saying everyone is telling you to go either to the left or go to the right but he said but i'm happy driving down the middle of the road there's plenty of space here because everyone's gone so far to each side and i thought that that what he said and that's not exactly you know he said it in a very matthew mcconaughey way about talking about dead armadillos and all sorts of weird stuff um but, he's, been, he's been reading a bunch of buddhist texts yeah that's, but i, that's I, buddhist I path. Yeah, I think I think what it, what he said there though was uh, okay. Well, but I guess the Buddhist part of it is it is definitely right because if you go one end, you lose half your audience. If you go the other end, you lose the other half of your audience. And it's almost better to let your art speak for itself, and then you get the biggest collector base possible. And also, you may change the minds of some people who disagreed with you by slowly bringing them in. I think. We live in an era where everyone's very much trying to force their view really hard on people rather than slowly bringing them around to understanding why you think the way that you do and i think that that's um i think that's what art can do is it can slowly bridge a gap and slowly slowly bring people to an idea without them even realizing that they're coming to it if i think about me as a brand in this particular instance, uh, I'm not nat I'm not a political artist. I did political art for a period of time, but I'm not a political artist. So this makes sense for me to go down the middle of the road. But a political artist might want to focus on, you know, a specific, yeah. you know, uh, group of people. You know, yeah, I'm trying to reach as many as I can. But yeah. that's neither here nor there now. This isn't about me. This is about art curation. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, we went off track there a little. Yeah. Um, Jay, are you waving? Is that what you're doing? I just wanted to raise my hand because I can. <laughs> Go ahead. What you got? How do you do it? Do that. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> oh, you can oh. react. Watch. Uh... Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yes. Oh, yeah. that. oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to lower my hand? Here we go. There we go. Go ahead, Jay. What do you got? <laughs> oh, no. Um, I, I think that the middle path is definitely beneficial in most cases. You know, unless unless your art is meant to provoke and, like, shock people. And some, so, sometimes people do need to be shocked and we do become complacent. You know, and in terms of curation, <laughs> um, I feel like curators oftentimes will shy away from that. You know, like if we were talking about super rare and like, I think it's interesting that we haven't touched upon the fact that there's artwork that has been removed yeah. from their gallery um, 
for curatorial purposes based on terms of service that a lot of artwork doesn't necessarily fall under, you know, but still up, you know, so there's some that it, it's selective in terms of what has been allowed to stay up on the site and what has been pulled down. Well, since this is trash art week, I fully intended for us to go there. Uh, oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I, can I just quickly, quickly jump yes. in with what I think? Is great. When I, when I curate, um, or at least when I, when I work to promote an artist, I, there's Sasha Bailey who has his own political set of views and his own beliefs. And then there's Sasha Bailey who works as a curator to promote artists. And when I'm writing a bio or I'm writing something for an artist, I will try and get inside their head and see their point of view and use the Socratic method, even if it's something I vehemently disagree with, to try and present their art in the best possible way for them. Because I don't believe that my person, I think it's just a matter of professionalism. You shouldn't let your personal beliefs ever get in the way of what you promote or who you promote. Yeah, your job is not your personal beliefs. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 what I wanted to kind of get across to people. So so whatever people think of me um, on my personal social media, I, I just want to make it clear that when I work for BAE or I work with an artist, that is not my personal beliefs do not come into any sort of promotional or uh, activity like that. I do it completely from a neutral standpoint as best as I possibly can. Yeah, I would, I would like to say that as well, like starting up a decentralized artist collective, whatever's shown there is not my personal belief. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it, I, I, I promote it's platform. Anything. Yeah, I think that it's, I think all voices should be heard, even as long as they're not directly inciting, as long as they're not actually doing something illegal, all voices should be heard. That's yes, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Within, yeah. within reason. Yeah. obviously obviously you know I'm, there is there is a limit um and it, and it goes i think on both ends of the spectrum there's a limit that i wouldn't want to want to put forward because it's just generally uh, not good but that's where I, that's where proper or appropriate curation i call appropriate but i i think what i'm saying is um <laughs> if you're a platform and you're curating you're curating within a certain worldview yeah. and you have, you have a specific audience you're not going to want excuse my crude language here you're not going to want pussies all over the page if that's not your I'm, audience i mean i'm i'm fine with whatever anyone wants to upload uh you should sure. see some of the stuff mr yuck puts up <laughs> um, sure sure but yeah. you know when i mean like you know it's super rare isn't going to want porn on their site yeah that's what okay is, what is porn though i think well, that's the that's 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 when you come down to the difficulty part right is, correct uh, yeah is what is what what defines porn what makes i i, I went to a erotic, erotic show at sotheby's once and um there were definitely some oil paintings that i would consider to be pornographic but yeah. they were selling them for hundreds of thousands of pounds so it's not you know it's, well then it's it, art right yeah yeah, yeah is it just the price tag <laughs> yeah sure Sure, yeah. sure. I think it's the ex well. I don't. I don't really have enough of a uh, knowledge about what is or isn't porn to even answer this question. But I think we could pose it to people who are listening, and maybe they can comment their thoughts. Maybe. Don't don't underestimate yourself. If someone's enjoying it, <laughs> if someone's enjoying it, then it's porn. Maybe that's how. It works. Oh, I, I see. <laughs> right. If you're if you're if you're aroused by it, it's porn. But if you're yeah. paying for it with money to show in your in your gallery, it's not porn. <laughs> yeah. If you show it in your house and you're quite happy having it on the wall, then it's not right. porn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although there are some people who I'm sure frame their um their porn magazines, so I don't know. <laughs> There's got to be someone like that out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh i had i had a bunch i had a question for you it's it's gone now no uh, we were talking about sorry trash art and the selective uh, oh yes sorry that's a, that's I, a, it was my fault I took it's a good segue in a different it's a great yeah. it's a great segue pouring it to trash art i love it um uh, one man's porn is another man's trash art uh so let's talk about trash art let's talk about so this week i'm going to be interviewing rob max and jimmy together and a little bit of history there. Um, uh, Jimmy was one of the uh, detractors of 
the kind of style of art that was that was happening on super rare and it caused a rift right i'm really interested in he in hearing their converse this conversation about them but what i want to talk about is the practice of curating as a form of censorship which is which is what i think in my opinion super rare did to robin max they didn't do it to me because i asked to be removed for violating their terms that's a whole other you know but robin max uh, both times i believe for max uh they were censored as opposed to being censored under the, under the terms and conditions um and that was that's super rare sort of way of yeah. curating but i don't i don't agree with it i think the i'm not going to get into it because it seems quite private but i think the max situation is far more complex than they're letting on um, because there was a lot of other things happening at the same time. And if you were on social media, you, you remember them. Um, that seemed to line up too much with his banning from Super Rare. I think that they used his copying images as an excuse to ban him when really it was about something else. But they were it, concerned it, about image. Yeah, they were concerned about image and they were concerned about the image. And then the, the funny thing is he then comes to um, BAE and he, he sold on BAE 1.0 a lot. And then suddenly he's back on Super Rare. And it's like, it it shows it shows that they really are just money, money, money. Um, the one thing I don't understand about Rob is why he still has Super Rare in his bio. That's that's a question that I, would, I wanna ask. Um, I know they all live in the same area. I feel like there's some, there's some um, uh, psyops going on there. Um, There's been lots of conspiracy <laughs> theories about yeah. Rob owning or being part ownership of Super Rare or Rareable or who knows what. No, I, I mean, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I just think it's odd that he still has Super Rare in his bio and he was banned. Um, that's, that's, that's my only part. Because, but the selective thing, I think it's ridiculous because if you go back, so when we were first researching this space, um, when we were building the BAE initially, and Super Rare, I think, was probably the only platform that existed at that time. And um, it was all trash art. A hundred percent of everything on Super Rail was trash art. Like it was all spinning gifs. It was all flashing images. So for them to then decide, like a year later, or, or not even a year later, a little bit later, oh, you know what? All of this art, we don't like it anymore. Um, stop making it. Is kind of a little bit. You know, that's what built them. They they wouldn't exist without the spinning gifs and the um, the Max Osiris's and the, and the Robness is that these, these people built, built their platform. Um, and I think it's, I think it's wrong to ban someone who built you just because you got bigger. And I think it, it really does speak to, uh, the LA big tech sort of way of doing things. I mean, that's exactly how YouTube acts. That's exactly how all of these big platforms act. They get a base, which is usually a little bit niche. Um, a little bit weird, has a lot of personality, and then as soon as they get big or they start making money, they remove that base because it, it's embarrassing to them. Now that well, the wider public looks at it, they were they removed the part that is the heart of it that has any actual like statement behind it. In my in my eyes, you know, like that you could have tons of spinning images and trash gifts, but the second where like it makes a statement about what's going on in the platform, like, and that's what was happening. It's like that both Max and Rob were making a statement about Super Air. Yeah. And therein lies another problem with curation is that you cannot speak out against the people that are in power. They yeah. will not allow it. Well, I, I actually want to make something, um, a, a tangent on that. If people want to make art that's anti-me on BAE, you can go right ahead. I, I've actually said this to many artists who have had a go at me. 
on Twitter. I, I've been called absolutely everything on Twitter in the last year, um, from one end of the political spectrum all the way to the other by one person or another. But if you want to put art that's anti-me on BAE, go ahead. If you want to put art that's anti-BAE on BAE, go ahead. I don't mind. I'm not going to ban you. I'm not going to censor you. You like That is something that I will stick to. So bring it on. Challenge <laughs> accepted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that I think you know we're kind of talking about, but not really, um, not really saying, is the influence of the collectors uh, in in Super Rare's decision to remove this kind of content. A few very vocal collectors, because when this was going on, um, and I had just know, gotten into know, the space you know, at the time. Yeah. What's that? We know who we're talking about. It's whale shark. Like we're better not be around. Yeah, there. and then he well, and then he it went. Was, it, and, wasn't just, yeah. it wasn't just whale shark. Mm. Like there were a few very vocal collectors, and I remember seeing. And there's names I can't even remember. Uh, I remember one statement, and it may have been a sent right up. Um, so like a well thought out, not like a Twitter post. It was like somebody had put a lot of time and wrote a essay pretty much and to surmise the piece it was pretty much saying that if a work of crypto art and they were trying to decide what should be considered artwork okay because this was coming up during the time of like trash art and uh, what do we need to decide a work of art and somebody said well if it doesn't sell it's not a work of art that might have been me um <laughs> That genuinely might have been my piece. Um, I said, I know, I, I think if, if it was the one that I wrote, I said, um, how do was you- Was that you? I said, how do you This is amazing. Uh, no, no, so I said, how do you decide when it's valuable? And I didn't say, I don't think I said specifically art, or if I did, that might not be exactly what I meant. I meant, so I have this thing about subjective, collective, and objective value. And when you make a work of art, it's art to you. It's your piece, you've priced it, it is artwork, but it's subjectively artwork. When someone else buys it and pays for it and appreciates it or says they like it and says it's art, it becomes collectively um, valuable. And then when many, many, many people have bought it and it's become, and you can go to a bank and you can get a loan on it, it's become objectively valuable. And I, I think I was more talking about artwork as value not as art because of course any piece of uh creativity that human creates is art by definition i was mainly talking about how you value it and i think yeah that was me <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I remember, agree with, I remember yeah. reading that piece like right <laughs> after i read whale sharks post and like <laughs> jimmy's post like i found your post like i this was just a, a new space to me and like coming in from like a you know new to crypto art and like he, coming into the scene and like trash gifts bam art and then if it doesn't sell it's not art no so i wasn't okay so i i i i was specifically talking about value i don't i, I think that everything's art if you say it's art if, if you've created a work of art it is art but i was specifically talking about how you how you get a value of art in an objective art dealer very money oriented sense not in yeah a, yeah not in an abstract um subjective or kind of way i was i was which is what art is yes yeah, yeah but i was talking about how you get from subjective to objective value in an artwork that's what i was trying to get across but yeah that was my post um <laughs> i'm gonna go back and edit it really quickly jay before. how do you feel about that post <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it it hit me pretty hard, like because it was it to me. It was in the context of coming into a new space, um, and I I was making trash gifts. Like I made tons of photo mosh pieces. Um, that that's like that's like all I did. That wasn't anti photo mosh though. That like I I would agree in context of that. If your photo mosh artwork sells, then it then has a value. It's not. You know, they didn't sell. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, I, 
so I think people misunderstand what I meant by that is I really did mean objectively capitalistically free market I'm not talking about you know value in the sense of whether it uplifts the soul or any of this sort of stuff I was breaking it down to its most basic is it is it worth something in monetary in a monetary sense um and I may not actually agree with a lot of the stuff I wrote back then uh but uh, yeah I, I'm gonna quickly go edit that set post <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it hit me really hard because um at that time max and rob had just been kicked off super rare and i was actually i'd been accepted to maker place maker's place and like known origin and was thinking about applying to super rare and i made a video and did not i was like i don't want to be a part of this this is ridiculous um so i didn't send it in and i remember reading i guess it was jimmy's one of jimmy's tweet that was like the hey crypto art this spam piece uh that i made where he, it was just like putting down so much of what was going on in the space based on an aesthetic um if this is trash art this is spam i think the max of max piece that he was referring to was like a screenshot of Max's mint base gallery. <laughs> so like Max took a screenshot of his gallery that was sold out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so there was all this kind of screenshot art going on um, and trash grit gifts and everything. It was like, what, what have I walked into in terms of this space? And like, if it doesn't sell, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think that was a moment where we were we were all like holding hands, dancing in perfect <laughs> harmony, and then suddenly that happened. That was the moment when the community stopped being this big harmonious kind of family, and it all broke apart. Um, pretty was, pretty quickly. It, yeah, it 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 was so. Before that, everyone was just positive. Every, and I literally, the, I think the day before that happened, I was telling people about crypto art Twitter, and I was like, it's amazing. It's like the least toxic place on the entire internet. And then it's like the next day. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, that article, I, I, really, I really was purely talking about a financial element. I wasn't talking about um and sometimes i will talk about that still it's, it's because there's two there's two sides to the way that i think about things there's the is this art valuable or will it be valuable and does it uplift um does it create an interesting message and does it uplift some stuff and then the other side of things which is is it objectively valuable and the actual fact of the matter is in crypto art nothing is objectively valuable yet we haven't reached that period of of um you know you might be able to get loans on nfts and you might be able to make nft derivatives which sure but i don't think that creates objective value i think that we're not we're we're too young as a community to actually get to the objective value stage of, of artwork you know you usually artwork takes 20 30 40 years to become objectively valuable um it has to run through several collectors and then usually an auction house like Sotheby's before you can actually claim an objective value on it well, I, I think uh, Wizard X said on a long enough timeline, like every every coin's gonna get wrecked. Yeah. You know, in terms of crypto art, that's probably true. But on on the other end, on a long enough time timeline, like every piece is gonna be priceless. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think art art is pretty much the only other thing other than crypto that can go up ten million. 20 million percent like you could buy a piece of you could have bought tr trash art for a dollar back in 2018 and that could genuinely be worth hundreds of thousands in the future um, yeah i agree yeah. i uh I, I think that you i think we're gonna see some real amazing sale prices and i don't think like you said i don't think they're gonna come from i think the long-term ones are not going to come from the centralized galleries i think they're going to come from where people can put whatever they want up i think we're yeah, seeing think most people will miss them i'm sorry go ahead no it's okay i was going to say i think we're seeing a little bit of of what 
what the future has to hold for art when we're seeing coldies go for 30 ETH or uh, Hackatows go for 30 ETH when you could buy them for a few hundred bucks less than two years I ago. I think you can still get Hackatows for a few hundred bucks on, on Origin. Um, <laughs> but just, just, uh, just a hint, I think, like some, which is kind of crazy people are missing there. <laughs> Um, Matt, Shh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to edit this out. Of the, no, I'm just You're going to curate. It. <laughs> I'm going to curate this entire conversation. <laughs> but yeah, but that's that's what I mean. It's it, it, it's kind of crazy. It doesn't make sense. This whole disparity between the different platforms. It, the if an artist is selling, if you're being charged more for the same product at a different store, that store is ripping you off, and that's 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 how the whole world looks at any brick and mortar store that's how the whole world looks at any downloadable file that's how the like so why it's only in crypto art um that we see this it's, it's literally the only industry i've ever seen where other than maybe no not even fashion because fashion there's a point there's a there's a label it's the only industry where you can have one product on one website and one product on another and it will sell for more on one website it makes no sense whatsoever and collectors really need to realize that why do you think that is, uh, you know, Jay? Why do you think that is? Oh, part of it's brand loyalty. Um, part of it is also, like, like I said, yeah, you know, power and wealth are gonna, they're gonna make sure that they retain that. And not only will they make sure they retain that, everybody else will be like, yeah, like we need to support this because one day that could be me. Like one day I could be that gallery owner or one day I could be that top artist. Um, so people will pour money into it in hopes that they will eventually get there. Yeah. Um, collectors and artists alike. I think that if there is some technical differences, I'm okay with it. Yeah, like let's say there's a higher quality file or maybe a token that has some, you know, there, there could be a difference between NFTs possibly. Yeah. You know, we've talked a little bit about on chain and, you know, you can think about metadata. Um, well, what or I you could... understand about that is the correct, you've minted on super rare. So you would know, um, Eric is, uh, super rare just does the NFT. Don't they? There's, there's no hidden file. There's no, <laughs> high resolution it's just it is just what you see right or am i wrong about that no that's right it is and it's on an ipfs it's uploaded so to it, an ipfs server. in a way super rare has the lowest quality product when it comes to the tech i mean like in a sense because i know known origin does hidden files uh, makers place does hidden files bae does hidden files uh rarible does hidden files i mean i haven't been on super rare yeah in a few months so if they made any changes i don't know okay i mean not like um, but i'm just saying it i don't it, it's it, it sadly seems like what uh, jay what you're saying is it is a hundred percent the brand that people are yeah. buying yeah because mm -hmm. really I, jim's product infant nft if it was purely tech would have been the most successful product out there because that one was without a doubt had the best archiving tech He's working on a product now um, that is supposed to empower artists to have their own galleries and also mitigate uh, galleries, website style galleries, uh, and also mitigate um, minting. So I'm interested to see sort of what, what he delivers, um, but it's, it's not yeah. live yet. When we look at Open C, I think they've done some really interesting work in support of artists uh, as an open platform with their with their uh, free minting, uh, you know, ERC eleven fifty fives. Do you do you think that we'll see more of sort of like that kind of artist centric technology happen uh, by other platforms, or do you think we'll see less improvement over time? With gas prices the way they are, I, I, I mean, it's going to have to go that way um, in order to support artists. Or are you really like pricing people out of the system, which I don't think is good? <clears throat> you know, like, so 
artists need that option to be able to mint for free or cheaply or else I don't even want to be a part of it, you know? Um, so I, um, I, uh, I agree that the, the gas fees are far too high, but I do think that there should be a small barrier to entry because it, uh, as I said, the, the, the very small fee that the BAE puts on the, um, on the tokens, it does seem to deter people from putting fake artwork up because suddenly oh, yeah. a, fi a financial risk on people doing that rather than with it being completely free, you do run the risk of a lot more fakes coming in. And I think, I think that has, there has to be a incentive based way to stop people from producing fakes. Um, not by force and not by you know with a blunt instrument but some way of incentivizing because those people who copy and paste from google if they rather than spending their time searching for those artworks to copy and trying to you know spend time trying to trick google reverse image search if they just spend their time actually you know transforming the artwork and making it into something new they would probably make a lot more money i've seen that happen Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen I've seen artists that have gone from faking and stealing other people's artwork and then hey being like hey you know I could do this and uh, Surian me, Surian Sur is one of them uh, who's quite successful right now but uh, in the very beginning he was steal or they were stealing art yeah. he's the one who's on who does the basket that style ones right yeah, I really like his Basquiat styles. Oh, they're I, they're awesome. Yeah, I I got him in trouble because I called out his rareable account, and I actually felt kind of bad because, but it was it was it was a bit egregious, um, how much he had copied. But um, I, but the Basquiat stuff, I, I'll defend him to the death on. I don't know why people get so angry about that. I think that he should he has every right to create in that style. It's not no one. It's only it. because they recognize it. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think that, you know, you're exactly right, Sasha. Like there, there's an opportunity for people to make money. Um, and if people would just, you know, there's the ability to right click and copy and paste, especially when you have like free minting, like you said. Um, so it is good to have some barrier to entry and people have to put their money behind what they believe in you know like if i think that's totally acceptable but even if it's like a dollar that's that's it yeah makes a big if it's, if it's yeah. a minimal amount even well i mean minting was really cheap when i got into it yeah it's like um minting and then sending stuff is like so cheap um so i didn't even have to really believe in it that much at all <laughs> it's like, I remember when it was 40 cents to, yes. to make an artwork. Crazy. Yeah. 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 So, like, um, but still, you think about it. If you're paying just a little bit, you do, there is some thought behind it. Um, and it is your money. So, it is a consideration. Uh, and also, like, if it's totally free minting, you could potentially just put stuff out there and see who bites. Yeah. That's true. It, it, it does. I, I, I just worry that um, everyone in crypto is, is relatively well behaved in crypto art. Like still, even though we get the fake artists, even though we get the scammers, they're still pretty damn well behaved. Like I dread to think of the day that one of those platforms that allows free minting gets raided by someone like 4chan or something like that. Like it's that's the sort of stuff that worries me is thinking into the future is when a group of people decide that they are going to spam something onto somewhere um, is going it, is when that system is going to have its flaws exposed. Like it's uh, Sasha, are you the only platform that does sort of like a cert, like a minimal service charge? Uh, what do you mean, like a, a min, like a, a min, some like you pay to mint the the artwork? I think I think we might be. Um, we do so. It's it, it works out. We always make we always adjust it. So it's always two dollars, um, and then it to do the minting. But then we only charge one percent for um, auctions because they cost a lot of gas. The way that we did them because the 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 uh, token gets held in escrow and so does the money. So it wasn't the most efficient system. 
Um, but then we have a secondary contract, which is free to list on, free to relist, free to delist, and because uh, it's offer based. So there's no gas at all after the first approve. Um, and we only charge 4% on that, 1% of which goes directly to the dev who created the website. Um, so it's, it's, it's minimal cost, uh, but yeah, there is a little barrier to entry. And that, that, that's also just to, I think it helps. I think it has helped us stop fakes uh, from coming on. And I'll, I'm, I think that's one of the ways that we've managed to incentivize people to not create fakes because of the financial risk. And it doesn't matter that the gas fee is 50 times higher than the fee that we charge. The fact that there's just this little thing that says you are going to be charged. It's almost like at shops where they put that thing, you are on CCTV when you're not. And it reduces people from doing the wrong thing. It's just this little kind of hint to if we catch you putting something up fake, you're just going to be wasting your money. And the fact, and not only that, you're not just paying gas, you're actually paying us to waste your money. Um, that's what, that's kind of the theory behind it. And it seems to be working. Um, How long have that, you been running with that? So free, well, since BAE 2.0, so free four months, because before on BAE 1, which was fully curated because it was just, a, it, it would have been impossible to have it open because I was, I was manually tokenizing everything. Um, so I, uh, that one was completely free, no gas, but we took 20%. But recently I actually, when people have been buying from that, um, cause there's still some artwork on there. It gives me a massive headache because it actually costs us money to sell the artwork, even taking 20%, <laughs> um, with the amount of gas that it is. So the new system, much lower fees, fully open, it, it works out a lot better, uh, and, and also it gives people more autonomy to sell their work. We also have a, so this is something we might change, but the resale fee, so the resale commission to artists is 4% on the BAE. And I know most platforms do 10% or allow you to choose, but I haven't made up my mind yet whether what I wanna do is either, it's either gonna be that the artist chooses what resale commission they get, or that there's a minimum amount that has to go back to the artist but the reseller picks how much they, they want the artist to get because uh, market conditions change. And I think that we need to think about the person who is collecting as well as the artist. So it might be like, say, um, you have to give 4% back to the artist when you resell, but you can give 10%. So if a collector who is more philanthropic is buying it, he might go, oh, well, I've made a ton of money from this. I'm going to give the artist 20%. So I, I don't know. I, I, that part I haven't fully decided on, um, but at the moment it's a flat 4%. Jay, I have to ask you, uh, who is the blonde that's staring at me over your right shoulder? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I found this head. In a it's been, junk shop. I've been meaning to ask you for a few hours, uh, and it's just been like. I found it's like. A, oh, it's bigger it's, than I thought it's it was. Huge! <laughs> yeah! Wow! <laughs> yeah, I found it at a junk store. I was like, I don't know what it is, but I love it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> can, can you wear it? I'm not asking you to put it on. No, uh, it's like it, uh, it looks like it went in a sculpture of some sort. Oh, so see. it's got this steel rod through it. Unfortunately, no, it's not hollow. Can't wear it. Wow, it's too cool. But yeah, yeah, and it's way bigger than I thought it was for sure. Yeah, the perspective was uh, was, was strange. It looks a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wild. Yeah, I I don't know. I it was a gift. Um wasn't appreciated when I gave it. <laughs> so, I, so now I got it. <laughs> but I, so what, I mean, what do you think about that on that front, Jay, with, with resale commissions and, and how, how they should be kind of handled? Because I guess that, that is kind of a part of the, the curation in the sense. Um, well, well, yeah. Um. In terms of like royalties for artists, yeah, royalties for artists, like how it how it should be set up. Do you think that it, it it's viable to have it as a fixed 
percentage? Because obviously then that creates this ladder that always increases. Or do you think that it's, yeah, well, how, how do you think, what, what do you think in a decentralized system would be the best way to handle it? Oh, uh, I don't know. It would be probably be nice to have like a minimum and then people could add to that um, if they chose to. Because I, I know with a fixed percentage, you're going to have some people that are going to try to avoid that through yeah. private sales. So I don't know. Um, With yeah, I, I, I would like it built into the tech where you have like maybe say a minimum and then you could just automatically bump that up. Uh, and that also, I think that system, if you have a minimum that can be increased, it deters private sales in a way that a fixed amount does not yeah you know what i'm saying yeah because like i guess that, that is the problem is people will just go outside the system if you force a certain percentage on them yeah if if it's like a minimum that can be boosted up though it's like if you go outside of that yeah you're just screwing over the artist yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you have to pay a certain amount it's like okay i can understand if you go out of that system if there's a minimum and it can be increased it kind of feels like yeah you just want to screw over the artist at this point yeah yeah i think um you, you the ui and ux of the product will also help deter um these outside you know sales so to speak to get away from yeah. if you make it so easy that it's just better for the entire process to occur in a product there nobody's going to go and try and you know especially if there's a trust issue like if i don't know who the seller is that i'm selling to using a trusted product helps mitigate that experience yeah. well i remember when a lot of the platforms went to like five or ten percent i I was reaching out to a bunch of crypto artists and I was going to start a 5% campaign. So I, I reached out to like Rob and did a bunch of trash gifts with like, I, I just downloaded an image of 5%, like the first stock Google image, you know, whatever. Um, and photo moss. <laughs> so I was going to start classic trash style. Yeah. It was a trash gift of 5%. And then like, I reached out to a bunch of people and then, um, you know, it was like pretty soon afterwards, Super Air had moved to 10%. I was like, wow, that's awesome. You know? Um, so I, I think there's definite benefit. And like we were saying, you know, some of these artists are getting a few bucks, a hundred dollars on the initial sale and to have collectors turn around and make ridiculous amount of profits off of that and yeah. not being willing to share 10%. It's absurd. Like, um, are you here to support the artist? Or are you here just to reap the benefits? And if you want to reap the benefits, by all means, go outside of the smart contract and send it to somebody in a personal sale. But if you actually care about the community, you know, it's built into the tech for a reason, you yeah. know? Do you think, though, when you get to a certain level of sales, like it becomes almost impossible to add the 10 percent on top of it so say you know it's it's relatively easy in the hundreds or maybe the thousands but when you get up to say a hundred thousand or something like that it might become a lot harder to add that 10 percent on and actually still make a profit do you think that it creates like an artificial ceiling oh i mean so when you get to that amount of money, it may, but you don't want to be that guy or person or you know the Holy collector. I, I, yeah, that yeah. collector buying at that that value where there is the ceiling. Yeah, and also, like in terms of a ten percent royalty, there are there is issue. You have to consider the tax as. You know, when somebody has a, that, that amount of money that they're making on a sale, so now you add on a 10% royalty. I'm not even sure how that 10% royalty, so let's say it's documented as a crypto art sale. 
10% is built in this smart contract to go to the artist, is that person taxed at the rate before the 10%? No, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. You know, like, are they paying taxes on the 10% that goes to the artist? Because yeah. you could be dealing with a huge amount of money. I so mean, that would encourage people to go out of outside of if you're in the uk or, the, or europe as well you're also talking about adding 20 percent vat on top so you're talking about a 30 percent increase to actually yep. make any money um which is kind of crazy yeah uh, so that's that's a huge amount of money yeah um if there could somehow in that transaction in in the crypto transaction that 10 percent goes to the artist before it goes to the collector that makes the sale i don't know that would be beneficial tax wise i would think you know yeah. i don't know how that works I, i've never had a sale that big on and never thought about it and maybe it, you know it's something everybody needs to start thinking about as we get these higher sales in the space at some point tax i, I guess because nfts don't technically exist under any um regulation yet um or at least they haven't been mentioned, they're probably in kind of a gray area of what they actually are. And I think that's what a lot of the platforms are relying on is, um, you know, that they're not really defined as a thing. Um, but yeah, I do but that, yeah, but that I do think that hits your like, wallet. Yeah. And it becomes, in, no, but I mean, like, so my question would be, does it technically count as capital gains because you had to spend money investing in gas in order to create the artwork or does it count as um for BAE we, we, we're very clear about the way that we're doing this if any tax people happen to watch this but um <laughs> but I'm just thinking in general from like an artist perspective is could you say that it's capital gains because of the fact that you had to invest that money in order to essentially purchase your artwork from the smart contract even though you created it and then divide that money from the money you received, or would you say that it's more like earnings? We're getting really off topic here, sorry, but I was just uh, uh, <laughs> curious. I don't know, that, I guess that's a question that um, would be interesting to answer uh, or interesting to, to find out. Yeah, I, think, I wish uh, I knew the answer. Yeah, I think we could pose it to anybody who's listening. Uh, yeah. If they do know the answer, you know, share it with us and uh, we'll get it some awareness i think a lot of artists and collectors and maybe even platforms would want to know answers to that kind of a question yeah and if you do know that answer um will you do my taxes <laughs> <laughs> in the u.s so my dad does my dad does taxes and he was talking to me about this he has to get you know he had to do a lot of uh education about about blockchain uh, you know, NFTs and cryptocurrencies. And what he was telling me was each transaction is taxable. Yeah. Yeah. Every single transaction. So if you're making thousands of transactions a year, you owe, you'll owe, you know, your taxes on those. Uh, but that was, that's as bad as deep as we went because he doesn't do my taxes um, anymore. Uh, in the UK, it's quite clear the, as long as you don't trade, a, if you trade a crypto for another crypto, it's taxable. But if you're just sending money around, it, it's not like there's like for like law. So if you're trading Ethereum for Ethereum, you don't have to pay tax on that transaction. But if you're trading Ethereum for, say, Bitcoin, you would pay tax on that transaction. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Got into a completely different subject there. Today. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's OK. <laughs> yeah. That's OK. I think uh, maybe we have exhausted the curation topic at this point. Uh, not 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 that it we've exhausted it in terms of like uh, what we can talk about and how deep we can go. But I think for this uh, panel, I think we've reached a good point and where we can sort of uh, stop the conversation. And, uh, you know, maybe in, you know, I'm interested in having more panels and then, you know, having people uh, talk about these kinds of topics in the future. So maybe we should move on to uh, the tax topic as, as something to look forward to. Yeah, we should get a few people who, uh, who, who definitely know what that's right, to right. about. Right, <laughs> yeah. uh, right. Before we go, I'm wondering, uh, Jay, do you have any sort of closing thoughts or uh, is there anything that maybe we missed that you want to make sure we cover? 
Um, now we covered a lot of ground that I really care about. And I think this, I'm, I appreciate you having me on and appreciate you, uh, Sasha, taking in part in this conversation and, um, you know, to feel like it's a great opportunity to think about curation in this new space because uh, curation has totally changed art history in terms of not just the way it's presented historically, but the way we experience art for thousands of years. Um, it, it's part of our story, our collective culture. So it, it can't be taken for granted. It's something that needs to be done intentionally. Uh, and in a decentralized space, I think we should take that into consideration and that should be part of our decision making process in terms of moving forward. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. It's um, I really appreciate you taking the opportunity to spend two and a half hours talking about this kind of stuff on the internet uh, and, and this sort of like space where we live by the moment especially on Twitter, it's sort of by the topic, right? Uh, by the tweet. Uh, we're rarely afforded the ability to have two hours of time to talk about something we're really passionate about. So thank you. Sasha, what about you? Any Anything that you think we may have missed or any parting thoughts? Um, just thank you for having me. I really appreciate you doing this. And, and, and anytime you want to have me on or um, want to be a part of it, I love having the opportunity to talk about this stuff. It's, it's really kind of my passion. And um, I guess just the finishing thought is I'm, uh, literally, I'm literally kind of great timing with this because I am in a space where I'm, I'm kind of taking a step back and trying to think about a new way of approaching um, this whole thing because because I completely agree with you, Jay, that everyone is kind of doing the same thing and it would be nice to step out of the box again and go okay we, we've created i think what we've done amazing is, is is we made digital art sellable we've made it um small time flipping possible which are incredible things um but just approaching this finding a new way to look at this whole thing um because i think that there's a there's a box we're all getting put into um and I think, yeah, and this has been a fantastic. Again, thank you so much for uh, hosting this, Eric. I, I yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. And the last thing I would say is we did talk about some platforms uh, and some people that were not here to defend themselves. And, th and they were invited to be a part of this conversation. There was no exclusions here. Uh, but if they do want to come on and you are listening and you do get wind of what we've talked about, um, I'm more than welcome to host another conversation to include all of you. I think the, this if, topic is bigger than just uh, than just what just the three of us. And I would have loved to have five or even eight of us here today. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I raised my hand. Um, <laughs> if they do take you up on that, can I curate it? <laughs> you sure can, Jay. You sure can. <laughs> and yeah, that, that, that goes the same for me as well. Anyone who I've spoken about, even I had a little bit of a rant about certain platforms, but um, I, I would love to actually have a conversation about it and properly air it because I feel like it's unfairly one sided and I'd love to hear the point of view as well. Um, well, yeah, as tra I think uh, just one more closing thing, I think as trash, trash artist or anybody who watched sort of the trash experience happen, we know, uh, we know what it feels like to be excluded from the conversation. Mm -hmm. And we're not about that. Uh, yeah. We want, we want, I don't mind having my, my mind changed. Uh, in fact, I welcome it. But let's have a conversation about it. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let me just do this sort of like, you know, stopping this live stream okay boom i stopped the live stream and let me stop the recording here